Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to open our session on hepatitis C testing and a linkage to care. We've got a packed um, uh, session. Um, and if I could encourage the, um, those who are presenting to come down to the front if they can. Um, so to say who I am, I'm Sharon Hutchinson. I'm an epidemiologist that works on our hepatitis C elimination strategy in, in Scotland and my co-chair. I'm Evan Cunningham. Um, I'm from the Kirby Institute in Australia, and I um, work on interventions to improve hepatitis C care in marginalised populations. Oh, going, going. Oh, is it back to me? I think you might need to. Oh, does it work? Okay. <laughs> um, so it's our job to marshal um, the session, and I'd like to get started by introducing um, Professor Matt Heckman. Um, who you all will know is Professor of Public Health and Epidemiology at uh, University of Bristol, and he's going to talk to us about a pilot HCV uh, birth cohort screening uh, project. Over to you, Matt, and you have 12 minutes. 12 minutes, great. I thought I had 15, but that's good. Um, thanks very much. I'm going to talk about our pilot HEPCAP. I'm going to talk now probably too quickly. Um, and I'm really glad I'm going first for you because I think all the speakers after me, you'll be very impressed by their results. Um, and this is a collaboration between NHS England, University of Bristol, uh, UKHSA, formerly Public Health England as well. Okay, so 85% of hepatitis C in UK and like many other uh, developed countries is acquired through injecting. And... To date, we've treated about 85,000 people in England, and our current models suggest that there's an, about 70,000 more people with hepatitis C to be treated, and 40 to 80% of that 70,000 are people with an injecting history. So that's people who may have injected a long time ago or may have only recently left opioid agonist treatment. And we've piloted lots of um, care pathways for people in or attached to associated with harm reduction services and in this intervention we wanted to try and uh, look at some interventions to identify people who are not in contact with harm reduction services. Um, we've done a previous study called HEPCAT, that's why it's similar to HEPCAP, where we had a primary care hepatitis C risk algorithm, so we identify people who might be at elevated risk of hepatitis C because they've been previously tested, or they had uh, um, indicators of injecting drug use. And in that study, 5% uh, of the adults in uh, primary care were flagged, adults, that is, about 15 to 65. And we invited them to be tested in various different ways. 16% of them uh, came forward to be tested. We found uh, about 6% had eight hepatitis C antibodies. And about 150 per 100,000 contacted uh, were um, referred and managed um, in hepatitis C care pathways. And this, has got, this, this tool is now then called the MSD NHSE Patient Search Identification Tool, which I'll continue to call PSI. And that's now on all primary care systems in the UK. Okay, so our HEPCAP was intended to test whether we could reach potentially a, a, the missing population who are not in contact with harm reduction services. It's a form of birth cohort screening, um, and also, but it's also linked to work that we've done in COVID when we sent out tests uh, through the post and also, uh, we did an early trial of chlamydia among young adults where we sent test outs for, uh, uh, in the post. And we wanted to offer an unselected group of uh, the population for a postal hepatitis C test. And our initial argument was from NHS England, well, well can you, out of 100,000 people invited, can you get at least 10,000 tests? And this is our design and data flow. So the pilot study was uh, registered with Open Science, also ethical approval for primary care practices to share their uh, patient list with um, UKHSA. And we piloted the study in research active practices in Bristol and Southwest, 
Yorkshire and Humber, and South London. And with the criteria was that it had to be a GP in each practice that had trained in good clinical practice and registered with our local clinical research network, and also willing to search their GP systems for uh, people aged 40 to 64 and send the details to UKHSA. And the practice raised awareness about the study and put up posters. Uh, there's an example of the posters. And people eligible were uh, those aged 40 to 64, and we excluded within the GP search patients receiving palliative care or cancer treatment, unable to consent. They already had been treated for hepatitis C or had selected a, a national data opt-out. And patient details were sent to the UKHSA and they were sent out an invitation letter, an example there, an invite letter down on the left, uh, with an electronic link and a QR code which directed them to a patient consent form. And if they consented, then we would send them uh, a test in the post. And this is a picture on the right, is an example of the test. It's an oral fluid test. Um, and then they would do the, basically it's like a sort of toothbrush, put it, put it in, a, in the bag itself and the, with an envelope that goes back to the hepatitis C virus lo laboratory and they test it for hepatitis C. And we sent for those where we could, samples which we couldn't test, we sent three times, we sent back kits. And hepatitis C test results were sent back to the general practice. Uh, participants who were hepatitis C reactive on the oral fluid test uh, were also, um, we told the GP and also the hepatitis C nurse, and they were contacted directly in order to um, get a, another test and also get them into care if they were diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C. So, um, principal outcomes was what it acceptable, and that was in, well, in relation with can we get more than 10,000 tests? Can we get at least an uptake of 10, 10%? But also we wanted to look at yield. How many hepatitis C antibody tests did we find, or those that were reactive on the oral fluid? How many people were diagnosed with hepatitis C and referred into care? And we wanted to assess cost effectiveness and then consider implementation. And we also wanted to know, where, well, could we have identified um, these people through just through the flag rather than um, sending letters to everybody in the practice? So this is uh, the first bit of data. Um, and so if we go down the flow diagram, so we had 25 practices uh, participated and that with about nearly 100,000 patients that were eligible. And then overall, 16,000, nearly 16,500, 17% of the population consented and were sent an oral fluid test. 74% of those, about just over 12,000, returned a sample. There were a few um, inactive samples, and we sent back a couple of times, uh, and then 340 individuals never returned a, a second sample. But in, in all, we had about 11,876 valid samples. So it's 12% of the patients identified. On the right also shows the, those that have got a flag. So there are about 20,000 of people with a flag on their practice that could have been uh, targeted for screening. And of those, approximately 9% um, sent back a sample. Um, uptake varied considerably by practice from about 9% to 26% of the population um, contacted. And that was probably a very um, willing and keen practice near, our, near the university in Bristol, to be honest. Um, it also varied by age group, and the younger age groups had a lower uptake than the older age groups, from 13% in the younger age groups to 23% in the older age groups, and it varied by social position, position with the most deprived areas having the lowest uptake of a 10% compared to 23% in the uh, more socially advantaged geographical areas. And so overall, these are our overall results. So this is over that, over that 16 and a half, well, 12,000 tests. There were 31 reactive on the oral fluid test overall, which is a, a, 
a prevalence of about 0.26%, um, and or a, a yield of 31 per 100,000 contacted. Only most of those 31 were weak uh, positives or moderate positives. Only three were strongly positive on the oral fluid test, indicating they're very likely to be antibody positive. Uh, and of those three, two had chronic hepatitis, um, which is about 6% of all of the positive tests. We still yet, we still got, we've got most of the results back, but of the weak positives, we've had no chronic hepatitis C cases late. So at the moment, that we've got just two cases of chronic hepatitis C, both of whom are in treatment. Um, but that's a yield of two per 100,000 contacted. Um, only slightly better for people with a flag, as you can see. So two-thirds of the strong, positive, weak, strong positives were uh, diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C, but uh, to date, none of the others have been found to be, uh, have got chronic hepatitis. So we're just waiting for the health economic data to come in, but I wanted to do this by analogy. Uh, so we did a, a birth cohort, we did a theoretical model looking at adding in hepatitis C testing to, to a health check that primary care used to um, do. We, we couldn't do it at the time because there, not many health checks now are voluntary and not many practices we contacted were, were still doing them. But in theory, we, we showed that if we added hepatitis C to a health check for people aged 40 to 70, it could be cost effective. On the right shows that, it's, that it varies by age group, but it also varies by transition probability. So that's the, the faster people progress, or the faster the model assumes people progress to um, more severe liver disease, the more likely it is to be cost effective. And at the moment, you can see in the right figure, you've got two transition probabilities, and one is much more cost effective than the other. It also, cost effectiveness in that theoretical model also um, varied by uptake of people into care and also by prevalence. But when we, ironic, well, not ironically, but the sensitivity test that we used in that earlier model actually didn't have a range of, of the prevalence that we were finding in HEPCAP. Um, so the yield assumptions from that cost-effectiveness model, which is borderline cost-effective, was that we would detect 140 per 100,000 people with antibody positive, with anti HC antibodies, that we would detect 95 per 100,000 people with chronic hepatitis C and get at least 30 to 60 per 100,000 into care. So that's um, between four to 40 times higher yield than we were finding in HEPCAP. So what we concluded is that actually HEPCAP, our, our, our birth cohort study was successful in terms of uptake. We, you know, people did accept it, did they did participate. Uh, we did get uh, oral fluid back into the lab uh, of, of greater than 10%. There was lower uptake in a younger cohorts and among deprived areas, which is probably where there's more infection. But the yield was very, very low. Um, it was slightly higher for people that could be flagged, but it was still too low, and much lower than our previous study, HEPCAT. There were, we don't find any people with chronic hep C who couldn't have been identified through the flag. It's likely that this flag, that the revision of the flag is still um, needs amending. It's picking up too many people, but it is certainly better than doing a, a birth cohort study. We, uh, I think you're out of time, Matt. <laughs> Anything, any last points? Yeah, my last, my, I got, I, got, I tell you what I've got is so, we don't recommend it goes forward. So there are other um, interventions that are going forward. One is there's now an app that you can download in the UK in which you can get a hepatitis C test. Um, you can order one, and, and, and that's just started in May, and that uptake is about, where we get finding 0.6% people with hepatitis C PCR, and that's 30 times higher than HEPCAT. And there's also, opt out, there's piloting in A&E, in emergency room, 
uh, where if blood is taken and people don't opt out, it's tested for hepatitis C, HIV, and hepatitis B, and that's going on um, in sites in London, um, Southwest, and, and Manchester. And there, the yield is much higher at the moment. We're getting uh, of about six, so nearly 700,000 tests. They've identified over 1,000 people with hepatitis C, a yield of 150, four per 100,000. And of those 681 new diagnoses, never been diagnosed, so a, a good enough yield. And that cost effectiveness will come next year. If I can draw you to close I'm closing. Okay, sorry. So, HEPCAT, no. Other pathways, yes. Okay, we've got... <laughs> we're going to move on to... Uh, we've got time for one or two questions. Over there, please. Yeah. So you can Bartlett. introduce yourself. Thanks. Sophia Bartlett from the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control. So among the baby boomer birth cohort in BC who are diagnosed with hepatitis C infection, they are more likely to be in postal codes that we identify from census data to be financially deprived. So I'm wondering, how did you select the postal codes and the other geographic areas where HEPCAT was implemented? And do you think that by more purposefully selecting postal codes or geographic areas that have that more deprived profile, would you improve the cost effectiveness by finding more cases? Um, I think the yield that we're getting at the moment, no. I think it wouldn't, we, I think that's a very interesting question. I think what we will do, we will put that into as sensitive testing and cost effectiveness, but it's very unlikely to be cost effective to this birth cohort model. But that's why I think there has to be other models where we're trying to det uh, pick up hepatitis C in people who are not in contact with harm reduction services. That was a great question. I think we've run out of time for questions. Yeah. I'm sure there are more. I've got one, but we'll have to save, save those for later. So thanks very much to Matt. And I'm gonna hand over. To Evan for the next speaker. All right. Okay, so uh, next speaker is um, Mrs. Yolan Andrews, uh, who is the key populations program manager at Networking HIV AIDS Community of South Southern Africa, Natosa. Uh, thanks very much. I just want to say I'm a bit shorter than the previous speaker. I hope everyone can see me. Uh, I just want to begin to um, acknowledge and thank people who inject drug, um, who are the service users of this program, as well as the co-authors, um, as well as TBHIV Care and Anova Health Institute, who were our project implementers who piloted the vital hepatitis services in their districts. Um, <clears throat> I think just to acknowledge as well that this particular slide comes from the National Department of Health uh, when they did their presentation on viral hepatitis. And then just to acknowledge that viral hepatitis in South Africa is quite a significant problem, particularly amongst key populations, sex workers, MSM, people who use drugs and transgenders. Um, and we have currently, you know, indication of 60% of the population with um, hepatitis B and HIV co-infections. Um, in 2017, particularly, we noted through a Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation study that was done in three cities, we noted an incredibly high, um, you know, hepatitis, um, hepatitis C infection. So when we tested for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, we noted a 5% hepatitis B positive amongst 941 that had been um, screened and 45% hepatitis C positive, and 21% with an HIV and hepatitis C co-infection. Um, so in short, basically, it's like one in two people um, who inject drugs have been exposed to hepatitis. Um, and unfortunately, despite this you know, uh, recorded and evidence-based um, prevalence, we still see a lack of hepat viral hepatitis testing, um, vaccination treatment and linkage to care um, in South Africa. So, uh, as a pro, Nicosa being a principal recipient of the Global Fund PWID program in South Africa, operating in eight cities or eight districts, we saw an opportunity within our opiate substitution therapy program to have um, to pilot vital hepatitis services. So, uh, I just want to note that when doing this, it was actually quite easy to be able to link it um, to the OST program in terms of cost effectiveness. 
So um, with this, we looked at, you know, unfortunately we had limited funding, so we needed to look at particular districts that we had the o OST programs in. And we had a small cohort that we were able to reach to ensure stability um, of the treatment. So from August 2021, uh, the P-word on OST was screened using rapid diagnostic tests. Um, unfortunately, budget limitations restricted us in terms of the number of confirmatory tests that we were able to do. Um, and, you know, we really relied on our nurses to lead in terms of counseling as well as in terms of um, testing. And uh, the doctors or general practitioners were the ones that were um, scripting in terms of DAAs that was provided. Um, at uh, 2021, uh, there were no DAAs registered in South Africa. And so we worked alongside the liver clinic at Grotteskeer Hospital, and they were able to access via Section 21 SAPRA application um, the DAAs that was required for the small pilot that we were doing. We do now have DAAs registered in South Africa, but unfortunately it is incredibly expensive. Um, and, and we still need to look at in terms of pricing around it. Um, I also just want to like, acknowledge that what really helped was in terms of strategic partners and experts um, in this field coming together and mentoring TBH of and Nova Health Institute around the, the implementation of testing as well as treatment. So I want to acknowledge, first of all, that this particular infographic that you've seen is not confirmed hepatitis um, prevalence, but it is all those that were screened for hepatitis B, um, C, and HIV. So we had 672 from April, August, sorry, from August 2021 to March 2023, 672 were screened for hepatitis. Um, and those uh, were 146 in Cape Town, 143 in Durban, and uh, 370 in Johannesburg, which is our largest district in terms of people who inject drugs as far as we've estimated. And then also 13 in Sedi Ben, which was a new district for us. Um, the hepatitis C prevalence was at 78%, uh, hepatitis B prevalence at 3%, which was not necessarily uncommon as we'd seen in previous studies. Uh, HIV prevalence was incredibly high at 32% and 29% hepatitis C and HIV co-infections amongst our OST patients. 62% um, of those that screened were between the ages of 25 to 35 years old, so a much younger cohort. Um, and also 84% uh, were, that were screened were male. And that's not unknown as well in terms of our p program. A large population um, is males. Um, but we do recognize that there are an increasing number of women who inject drugs that remain hidden within our um, districts or our cities because of the patriarchal drug, drug culture. And um, our implementers with the psychosocial staff is looking at how do we mobilize as well and employ you know, women who use drugs as well to be peer educators to help with demand creation. Um, we want to acknowledge that 78% of those that were screened were positive, as mentioned before, and of those screened positive for hepatitis C, 84% were males, so that was 439 of those. 64% um, were between the ages of 25 to 35 years old. So this particular um, uh, graph uh, is just representing the hepatitis uh, cascade. And as you can see, it acknowledges some of the successes of this pilot and of this program, but it also highlights some of the challenges that we've had in terms of adherence to treatment and, uh, you know, the cure dates. Um, as I mentioned before, the hepatitis C prevalence was 79%. Um, in total, 162 p -word received confirmatory testing, um, and 84% 84 per, 84 had confirmed infections. That was 74% hepatitis confirmatories um, in Durban, 80% uh, confirmed hepatitis C positive in Johannesburg, and 93% confirmed um, in, in the city of Cape Town. Um, so obviously this is showcasing the fact that vital hepatitis services is a priority for our key populations. Um, there was no confirmatory done in Sidi Ben, um, but we want to acknowledge and thank again our implementers for the treatment readiness counseling that they provided. Because 108 of those that were confirmed positive started treatment. 
and 76% of them completed treatment. Please acknowledge that a large population is homeless in South Africa of the people we inject drugs. So for to them, for 76% to having completed treatment, um, you know, is really something to, to be applauded. Um, yeah, no, you can applaud, you must applaud, because the Nova Health Institute is right there. Thank you. Um, 24 people received the sustained biological response test um, at 12, post 12 weeks, um, with 79% reported with a cure rate. So that's 19 of the 24 that had received uh, SVR 12. I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the successes and challenges, even though you got a glimpse of it in the graphs and in the infographic. But I want to acknowledge that, you know, this uh, a community-based program for viral hepatitis really showcase what we can do as South Africa with limited resources and with the support of opiate substitution therapy. So we were able to do, you know, awareness and capacity building around the context and in the context of HIV prevention as well. Um, we were able to strengthen the network in terms of care to PWID in the public sector. And as I mentioned before, the fact that it was layered to the OST program meant that, you know, it was more cost effective as well. We do also want to just acknowledge that, you know, the partnership with Grotteskeer Hospital, the liver clinic, was incredibly valuable in terms of accessing DAAs. Um, and for the first time ever, uh, the PWID program or Possibly South Africa has had good data on the hepatitis C prevalence um, across OST programs and even to be expanded to non-OST as well, we probably see significant prevalence as well. Um, the treatment uptake was good with 82% of those confirmed um, positive having uh, been initiated on DAAs. Um, but this again is linked to psychosocial support. Without it, we wouldn't have seen the results that we saw. 76% of those that were in DAAs have completed treatment. Once again, psychosocial support. Resourcing this is critical in any treatment program, whether it be diabetes, HIV, or hepatitis. Um, and I also think that, you know, unfortunately, there were some challenges in terms of accessing government laboratories to do the confirmatory tests. And so we had to move to private labs, which was successful in terms of the program, but definitely not cost effective. So that leads me then to comment on about some of the challenges. Um, so some of the challenges were, you know, limited investment in harm reduction and vital hepatitis services, not only by external donors, although we are fortunate to be principal recipients of Global Fund, but also by the South African government in terms of the Department of Health. Um, there were threats to sustainability and there continues to be threats to sustainability. I think we all sat in uh, the earlier session this morning when they talked about the financing gap for harm reduction services, and this cuts across as well to vital hepatitis services. <coughs> um, the hepatitis PCRs were only done at certain government labs, and unfortunately there were cases where bloods had to be transported and bloods were lost, which meant delays in giving the results to patients and delays in DAA initiations. There was also an issue of, you know, skills around hepatitis amongst clinicians, so the delays in you know, employing cl clinicians that were you know, able to, to take on this treatment and also the level of effort of doctors being limited meant that there were missed opportunities for initiations. And so some of those clients that were confirmed, unfortunately, were lost to follow up. Um, we also wanted to indicate as well that we mentioned earlier about the limited access to DAAs. Um, we had problems in that period of time, and now, as I mentioned, DAAs are registered in South Africa. But you're looking at a cost of to complete a, a complete course of treatment, you're looking at approximately 1,600 US dollars for one patient to complete treatment. And so the fact that it's not on the essential medicines list in South Africa, and the fact that NGOs such as NACOSA and ANOVA and TBHF Key are unable to access the public sector um, you know, uh, financing amount or the costing does put limitations in terms of the number of patients that we can initiate on DAAs. And then I also just want to talk about the DAA retention challenges that we had. And this is the reality, is that the PWID community ha have strife, they have struggles. And so what we have seen is that some clients are not ready to start treatment. And there are difficulties in retention of DAA treatment when someone is not stable on OST or have also been lost to follow with OST treatment. 
Um, we also noted that there has been side effects and the fact that our population are impoverished or homeless means that they don't necessarily have the nutritional support to be on daily medication. And then also the fact that you know, resourcing of psychosocial um, support is lacking. Um, I do want to acknowledge though that this pilot has resulted, um, this pilot that was done from April 2019 to March 22 in the Global Fund grant period, has led to viral hepatitis testing, um, uh, screening, vaccination, and treatment now to be included in South Africa's minimum package as well for the PWID program from 2022 to March 2025. And so what we are seeing is that it's now currently not just implementing the two or three cities we spoke about earlier, but now being implemented in five cities in South Africa with a positive effect on key populations as well, cutting across intersectionalities. And also, we're hoping to expand it in other global funded cities, you know, once the OST is expanded as well. I just want to conclude, and I hope I have enough time, but I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, this intervention that was implemented through the Global Fund grant through NACOSA and the, the district implementers have shown and we've always known that there is a heavy hepatitis C burden in South Africa, and especially amongst people who inject drugs. We, are, we know that there can be testing and treatment can be feasibly implemented in a, com a community-based setting, and it can be done alongside OST. We've proven that it can be done with good treatment completion as well. Um, we also recognize that you know, the cost of conformity testing DAs needs to be introduced, or needs to be reduced, sorry. And also we need to be making sure that we prioritize psychosocial support and also look at decentralized hepatitis C um, services and the scale up of those in South Africa. We also, as I mentioned before, need to look at you, the DAA has been included in the essential medicines list of South Africa. And we also need to continue to look at having it scaled up in 52 of our districts. And lastly, NACOSA commits, as always, that we will advocate for the upscale and the escalation of needle and syringe programs, vital hepatitis services, as well as OST in South Africa, because we know that it saves lives. We've seen it. And so I just want to again say um, a thank you to our service users for allowing us to provide this evidence in support of harm reduction program development, as well as for funding advocacy. And I'd also like to thank Global Fund Frontline Aids with NACOSA being its innovation action convener, showcasing innovations such as this. I want to thank Frontline Aids, Global Fund, as well as INSU for allowing us and providing us the opportunity to present this important work and to advocate for the scale up in South Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just out of time for questions, but I'm sure Yolan would be very happy to answer questions if you grab her in a break. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yulan. And if we can move on to the next uh, presenter um, and welcome uh, Zoe Ward, who is a research fellow in infectious disease modelling at University of Bristol, who's going to talk to us about impact of scaling up HCV case finding and treatment in England. Over to you, Zoe. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened there. <laughs> uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm University of Bristol. I'd just like to thank the organisers for allowing me to give this talk today. Um, Matt's already given a bit of an introduction about um, hepatitis C in England. Um, so I just want to say amongst PWID, the um, uh, chronic prevalence is about 28% in uh, 2015. Um, and the rest of that probably you already know. Um, but I'm just going to say that... Uh, as was mentioned this morning, the incidence target for elimination uh, amongst this population is two per 100 person years. And so that's what I'm going to really be um, talking about today is whether what we're doing in terms of testing and treatment is enough to reach that target or whether we need to do more. Um, so the project uh, I'm going to talk about uh, actually had three work streams and I'm just going to be talking about the modeling today. Um, and as I said, it's about the impact of what's currently going on, what testing is going on, and where it's going on, and if it's effective or not. Um, and I'm going to be discussing four areas in, the, in England, so Bristol, uh, Nottingham, North East, and Cumbria, and Manchester. 
Um, so it's a mathematical model. I, I haven't got any equations in here, so don't panic. Um, it, but it is a big model, um, which we try to make sure that we incorporate all the important places that people can be screened for hepatitis C. Um, so we have prison in the model. Um, we have opiate substitution therapy centers in the model. Uh, we also have a needle and syringe provision in the model, although that didn't turn out to be somewhere that um, was really acceptable for people to be tested. Uh, in England anyway. Um, and then we also have um, the care cascade. So we have infection, um, spontaneous clearance, we have chronic infection, we have whether they've been diagnosed, uh, whether they've, uh, they're on treatment, whether they've failed treatment, whether they're being retreated, and whether they've reached SVR. So there's a lot going on. Uh, so to parameterize that model, um, we've used multiple data sources, the main one being the UAM survey, which is an unlinked anonymous monitoring survey that goes on every year in England. Um, and from that, we've used data on harm reduction uh, coverage, uh, levels of homelessness current and ever, um, incarceration dynamics, so uh, what proportion of the population has ever been incarcerated by injecting duration, um, antibody prevalence, as well as the percentage of those antibody positive with chronic infection, and also, um, we didn't really use percentage tested ever and in the last year because it's actually a really difficult data point to use. Um, then we also have information on treatment from the Sentinel surveillance in the UK. Uh, it's actually, it says UK HSA, but actually it's only England. Um, then we have the treatment database, again, only England, um, which is meant to be where uh, hospitals put up Every single person who goes on to treatment is supposed to be on this database. And that was great until 2019, and then in 2020, we had the pandemic and everyone had far too much to do, and the numbers that got put on there dropped. So we've had to use another data source, it's actually pres prescription level data from NHS England, which is the total number of treatments, but unfortunately it doesn't give us the risk profiles of those who are having treatment. Um, and unfortunately all of those uh, don't give us any information on the testing for people who inject drugs. And the model itself is fitted using uh, Bayesian methods, and if you have any questions about that, you can ask me later. I am definitely not going to go into that now. So here are some um, of the model fits. Um, so we have, uh, as I say, incarceration data on percentage ever incarcerated and the mean number of incarcerated uh, incarcerations over uh, injecting duration. And as you can see, uh, the model fits quite nice, nicely to that. Uh, in terms of homelessness data, uh, we have proportion currently homeless, proportion ever homeless, and um, the odds ratio of, being current, uh, of current homelessness if recent or non-recent prison. That's a really random data source, but um, uh, that's another uh, point that we could use. And all of these help to fit certain parameters in the model. Then we have the data on OST and NSP. Um, and again, the model fits really nicely. The bottom graph there is antibody prevalence, which is the more interesting one. And we have quite a wide range. This, these are all um, outputs for Bristol, by the way. I should have said that earlier. Um, and for Bristol, there's uh, multiple data sources. So there's some, actually some uh, community surveys that were done uh, prior to sort of 2010. Um, and those were quite high prevalence uh, surveys. Um, and so what we've done is we've said we'll accept any of the model fits that were within that sort of range of data sources um, because those earlier community surveys were actually very Bristol focused which has a higher prevalence than the rest of the, the, the cities and towns that are in that um, delivery network. So then on to um, treatment numbers. So as I said the treatment database gives us the treatments for referrals from different settings, so um, prison, drug treatment centers, and then we lump everything else together as other. And the graphs here are showing um, yearly data um, in people who inject drugs um, who are, uh, are listed in the treatment database as current or recent. Um, and this, this is a bit of an issue and we're, uh, in terms of uh, sensitivity analysis, we did a bit uh, of work on that, uh, which I'll show in a minute. And as I mentioned before, the data from 2020 onwards uh, are less reliable um, because numbers were just not, people were just not being put in the treatment database. So we've had to use this uh, extra data source um, and, and make some estimates 
again, another reason why we've done some sensitivity analysis on it. Um, in, in terms of uh, parameterizing the testing and linkage to treatment and also SVR, um, we've been able to use data from the Sentinel surveillance, um, which includes positive and negative tests, and then also site of testing, and that can be linked where the record is available to the treatment database. Um, and so we can see you know, how, how, what proportion of people have been linked to care. So that's uh, shown in the table at the bottom for prison in Bristol specifically. Um, so um, you can see it, it hasn't really increased a great deal since sort of 2015, um, which is surprising, right? Um, but the time to treatment is where the big, big change has occurred. So it used to be that it, it might take three, four, whatever number of years to get onto treatment pre-DAAs, but um, you know, since then, that time has gone down to sort of three to six months or even less. Um, the other surprising uh, bit there is the SVR rate, which looks dreadful, um, but again, that's, it's partially a reporting issue, and we did do a sensitivity analysis assuming that the SVR rate was much higher. Um, in order to uh, make this all work, because you know, there wasn't actually any testing information on those tables that I just showed, um, we assume that each uh, location, prison, drug treatment centers, and other, um, have different testing rates um, for two different uh, time periods, uh, and pre-2015. And we calibrate to the treatment numbers so that we, we're letting the treatment rate, um, testing rate vary and then we let it vary so that it gives us the right number of treatments in the end. So here's the, like a, an example from Bristol where we're calibrating to cumulative uh, treatment numbers. Um, and you can see it, it kind of, you know, it all looks good so far. So using the calibration results, what do we then do with it? Well, we extend it forwards to 2030 and we'll look at whether the incidence reductions are what we need to reach the elimination target. Um, we also do a few sensitivity analyses to check all of these assumptions that we've had to make in terms of uh, the proportion of all of the treatments that are going to people who are still at risk of infection. Um, we also did a sensitivity analysis on whether um, uh, the treatments are successful or not. So up to 95% instead of like 75, 80%. And then we also looked at a few sort of scenario analyses. Oh, I mentioned the treatment first. Treatment one first, sorry. So the big treatment assumption that I mentioned where we've had to sort of make an estimate of treatment numbers from 2020 onwards. Um, one thing we noticed in the, in the data is that uh, in the treatment database, about 50% or 60% of those people being treated were down as being current or recent um, people who inject drugs, but they were being referred from drug treatment centers in prison. And we thought, how is it that low? So what we've done as an assumption, as a scenario analysis, is we've assumed that everybody who was treated in those locations were an at-risk population. Um, so that's one of the scenarios. And then we also tested out what would, what would happen from 2024 onwards if we assume that um, testing is in drug treatment centers is at 80% of people getting tested every single year. And in prison, if 75% of people get tested within the time that they're in prison, which is actually what the guidelines say we should be doing. Okay, so some results finally. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, top panel, top row of panels is antibody prevalence. So that's sort of showing, um, you know, uh, what's happening to the antibody prevalence over time. The red lines are uh, the counterfactual where we haven't put DAAs in. Uh, well, sorry, we haven't put in an increased testing and treatment. Uh, we've only put in that the SVR is increased. Um, and the blue line is um, the main model calibration um, for, the four, for the four ODNs. And then the yellow line is this treatment assumption where we're assuming that everybody who's been tested and referred from drug treatment and prison are in this active population. You see it makes quite a big difference. Um, the middle boxes are the RNA positivity, so the, you know, the percentage of those who are antibody positive who are chronically infected still. And you can see that 
you know, the treatment assumption makes a really big difference. If the treatments are actually being targeted to the right place, it makes a massive, oh, massive difference. One minute difference. left, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, and then at the bottom there, uh, that's the really important one, which is the incidence. So you can see that um, most of the, so the three of the settings, they're going to reach uh, less than two per, two per 100 person years, um, uh, all except Nottingham. And that's because in the, um, in the main analysis, they're the ones that aren't supposedly targeting properly. Um, this is my last graph. Um, so uh, this one shows uh, the, uh, what happens with the other options for uh, testing and, in, and linkage going forwards. Uh, and the main point to note is the, uh, I think, the prison testing. So if prison testing, because that's the, like an easy one to do, if we just did what the guidelines said for prison testing, we would definitely reach the target in all settings, including Nottingham. Um, and I've basically said all those things already. The next step um, is to do cost effectiveness um, analysis on scaling up strategies specifically in Nottingham, like which actually is the best method and most cost effective method to reach the target in Nottingham. Thank you. Many thanks, Zoe. Excellent talk. Um, any questions from the audience? I know I've got a few. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, you've modelled both the, the kind of prevalence, and I think you've calibrated it to the antibody prevalence, if I'm correct, but you can see how it marries up with the chronic prevalence as well. There's no data, is there no observational data on incidents, and I'm just wondering if there's anything here that we can, we, so we're lacking any kind of observational data on incidents to, to yeah. demonstrate that what you're modeling mm. um, reflects w what we see in observational data. No, you're absolutely right. There isn't any uh, recent incidence data. So there's some incidence data from Bristol, but prior to DAAs. Um, but it is within the region of what, what we're showing for incidence levels then, I think it was something like 14 per 100 person years, off the top of my head. Um, we do uh, calibrate to RNA positivity, though. Yeah, and I think that highlights how difficult it is and challenging it is to actually get um, empirical data on incidents, but we mm -hmm. have got, and we're probably going to have to um, you know, use these models to get at incidents, really. Any other questions? from the audience. If not, if we can all just thank Zoe for her talk and we'll move on to the next chapter. Thank you. All right, next up we have Miss Emily Adamson, um, who is a health promotion program manager at the Burnett Institute. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, today I'll highlight the key findings from the evaluation of uh, hepatitis, oh sorry, a oh, wait. <laughs> I've got three, min three minutes, so I'm eager. Today I'm going to highlight the findings from the evaluation of a hepatitis C health promotion campaign, which is known as It's Your Right. It's Your Right was the first Australian-wide hepatitis C campaign co-designed and delivered by peer workers with living and lived experience of injecting drug use and or hepatitis C. To, to use a peer-led approach to design the campaign Eliminate C Australia, which is part of the Burnett Institute, worked in partnership with the Australian Injecting and Illicit Drug Users League and their national peer network across Australia. So I'd really like to thank our partners and all the peers and people who inject drugs who are involved from our campaign from the start to the end. We rolled out the campaign between April and December last year. I'd also really like to acknowledge the funding we received, which was from the Paul, Ram Paul Ramsey Foundation and the Australian Government Department of Health. So, It's Your Right aimed to increase hepatitis C testing and treatment in people who inject drugs using a peer-led approach. The campaign strategy linked people who inject drugs with peer workers and trusted local services. The, 
we also combined in the campaign colourful, vibrant, rights-based messages which we used in street advertising and local services. You can see in our photos on the screen, um, our messages were designed to address misconceptions about hepatitis C treatment. We used an empowering rights-based approach. We promoted these messages across paid advertising and in services such as pharmacies and needle and syringe programs. The campaign was an intensive three-month three month burst in each area. And we rolled it out with eight implementing services. Each of these services had peer-led approaches and peers, and they used a range of activities which were tailored to each area. And these included things like point of care testing events, financial incentives for people engaging in testing and treatment, and also merchandise to start conversations about hepatitis C. So I just want to highlight some of our key findings from our evaluation, and we used a mixed methods approach. Some of the key findings include that there was 2,595 conversations about hepatitis C between clients and peer workers and other harm reduction staff during the campaign period. 1,343 people were tested for hepatitis C by the implementing services, and 151 people were referred for hepatitis C treatment. 1,235 financial incentives were given to people for engaging in testing and for starting treatment. We surveyed 165 people who inject drugs about the campaign and we had really good campaign recall. So 53% of people were able to recall the campaign, the campaign messaging or images or the locations that we advertised in without any prompting. 38% of clients surveyed spoke to a peer worker after seeing the campaign as well. So they took action as part of the campaign. And 31% got tested for hepatitis C. So in conclusion, It's Your Right provided opportunities for community organisations to use um, an empowering health promotion framework to engage clients. The campaign succeeded in linking people who inject drugs to peer workers. And the visibility of the It's Your Right campaign enabled peers to start conversations and paired with financial incentives and easier ways to access testing, this also led to increased testing throughout the campaign period. I shall leave it there and open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Yes. Thank you for a great presentation. Stefan Bourgeois from Belgium. What were the incentives and was it, uh, could you pass it easily through an ethic committee? Um, so the incentives were financial. So most services used, used cash and it varied from $10 um, to $200. So each implementing service had a tailored model of handing out the incentives. So they used it for people coming in to get a test, coming back for their test results, and then also referring their friends to come in as well. And then in areas where they felt um, um, there was kind of losing people to start treatment, they would give an incentive for someone starting treatment or ending treatment. So it was quite a flexible approach. But um, the feedback was that the incentives were critical to engaging people in that treatment pathway and also to engaging new people who, who um, weren't engaged in hep C testing and treatment. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, just one quick one. Hi, uh, how did you engage Aboriginal folks in designing the outreach or responding to the outreach? What was that process like? Thank you, such a great question. We were really fortunate to receive some extra funding to reach Aboriginal people across Australia. So we did actually design um, tailored messages and artwork to engage Aboriginal people coming to the services. And through the evaluation where we did some focus groups with implementing services, it was a really good way of engaging Aboriginal clients coming through the services and um, being tested for hepatitis C. All right. Thanks so much. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure to uh, 
introduce Christiana Merendiro, who is a uh, project manager at Cresker, a community intervention association, and she's going to talk to us about the REACH U project. Over to you, Christiane. So, good afternoon, everyone. I will present the Ritchie project, which took place in Lisbon, Portugal, between 2020 and May 2023. And it was developed by CSIR, which is a harm reduction and community-based association. But first, I want to uh, begin by acknowledging and thanking the people who have participated in this project, and also uh, our stakeholders um, who helped make the project a reality. Uh, so this is our declaration of interest. As you can see in this picture, REACHU is a, a decentralized intervention which aims to overcome barriers to HCV care in social excluded populations that may not be connected to any other social, health or even uh, harm reduction service. Um, we can see here an uh, outreach model meeting people in their places. The first two pictures um, illustrate an open drag use scenes in the middle of hoods. Uh, the last one uh, illustrates a city space and a bridge where people spend the night, but we run the project in other city spaces uh, as well. We also establish partnerships with other organizations that uh, attend projects to this population and uh, we uh, run the project uh, in their facilities. REACHU participants are mostly males, uh, Portuguese, uh, with an average of 44 years old, experiencing homelessness. Approximately 56 reported uh, recently sharing injecting equipment, and 58 uh, were not engaged with uh, any uh, health service at all. So, based on proximity and the relationship-based approach, which is inherent to harm reduction work, we developed on-site an individualized intervention from referral to follow-up, trying to uh, prioritize an holistic view of uh, people's necessities and therefore uh, they're addressing uh, social needs um, related to shelter or to food as an integrated part of this uh, healthcare process. In this process, the testing and the follow-up uh, are through the finger stick method. Appointments uh, are made on the street or on the, the point of, uh, at the point of care, and medication uh, is available through directly observed therapy uh, in case of need. To respect the difficulty that is for vulnerable people to interrupt their survival uh, activities to take care of their health, we also provided financial incentives to people who participate and also to informal peers um, who promote the connection with other participants and I mean people who bring uh, other people to participate. Oh, sorry. We compare the reaching results with previous ones uh, obtained before a decentralized approach was in place. So um, we compare the previous standard care that you can see on your left where RNA tests and appointment were taken um, in the hospital with the REACHU decentralized model that you can see um, here on the left, on the right. Uh, the decentralization, as we can see in the results, uh, reduced drastically the dropout numbers, uh, improving the number of people who adhere to specialized appointments uh, from 30 to more than 80%. And the ones who completed treatment for, uh, from 40 to around 86%, as we initially predicted. To conclude, I will just highlight some lessons learned. The decentralization of specialized medical work to community settings as a way of promoting social, social justice. Peer engagement, and I mean informal uh, and informal ways, as a must do to promote familiarity and the sense of uh, security to participants. It is important not to forget trauma based approach uh, guidelines in this work. Financial incentives are a must needed. Um, taking care of health should not put in question the daily income of an already very vulnerable population. 
and um, our focus should be in the holistic view of the person and their perceived quality of life. And with, with this, I mean that uh, healthcare and social care needs both to be prioritized when we are talking about uh, such vulnerable populations. I will leave you with a short footage um, where a rich peer and a participant give their testimony. I can follow someone from the beginning till the end because I've done that and I've been there and I try to empower people to solve their health issues. It's the way they interact with people and the way they present themselves, you know. They don't patronize, they, they just come over and treat you as an equal and that's very important streetwise. talk Christiana I'm afraid we've run out of time but I think you've demonstrated very clearly how decentralized uh, care is the way to go I hope that, that you've managed to persuade people in your country thank you very much I'm afraid we'll have to move on to the next uh, speaker over to you Alex. yes thank you so it is my my pleasure to introduce my colleague Alex Willing from the Kirby Institute uh, at UNSW Sydney in Australia Thank you to my lovely co-authors and participants. No disclosures. So simplification of HCV testing technologies has allowed scale up of testing and treatment of at-risk populations in various service settings. We were interested in provider perspectives on the incorporation of these into standard of care to inform optimized implementation of these technologies. Between these dates, I interviewed 36 providers from community-based services providing care to people at risk of HCV infection, about HCV point of care and dried blood spot testing experiences and challenges to implementation. Codes were informed by the interview guide and an implementation science CIFA framework. 21 were in nursing roles, 20 were working in New South Wales, 23 had DBS experience, and nearly all had point of care experience. Analyses indicated that most participants held positive views of new testing modalities. For both methods, people mentioned the simplicity, the finger prick acceptability for clients, the flexibility of the system for outreach, and people especially mentioning point of care positively over alternatives, the short time until result, and that in general, it simplified the overall care cascade process, supporting its use long term. Participants also still used phlebotomy to test for other comorbidities. Participants did indicate barriers for this implementation. Many identified an increased workload due to additional care pathways that were being added without provision of more human resources. To make sure that the running of the machine is working well is a challenge for me as a doctor who I just want to see patients treat patients. Preliminary analysis suggests that those with supportive environments may be managing the challenges with the care cascade more easily. Participants often described a lot of investment in patient navigation. We're able to test a whole range of our clients, diagnose hep C and treat more quickly. We've got the peer staff to engage with clients and then either bringing them in or they'll go out and see them in their home. Providers also reported mixed views on the best setting for testing modalities, especially uh, DBS, e.g. in-clinic, outreach, uh, screening campaign, or mail-out testing. So while we're decentralizing and forming recommendations, it's important to keep in mind that settings can have different workflows and infrastructure available Therefore, different approaches and different testing methods may be needed. The outer setting presented barriers noted here, some of which were mitigated by facilitators within the clinic setting, noted here. Uh, and in conclusion, the expansion of HCV testing and care necessitates that additional support, e.g. adequate funding and staffing, be implemented alongside the increased expectations put a put upon healthcare providers. 
Despite the adaptability of providers, we need a flexible approach to suit the needs of all clinic settings. Fantastic, thanks so much, Alex. Any questions from the floor? I think we have time for one quick one. If not, I do have one quick question. I was just wondering, was there any indication from some providers that they perhaps weren't so interested in having testing occurring within their clinic and they would rather that be outside? Or if everyone was generally, if they had this, the, the resources, happy to have testing occurring on site? Uh, I'd say it was the second in general. Everyone was fairly positive and keen to have, you know, as options. Yeah, so it really just came down to re testing. resourcing to make sure that they weren't overburdened. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Great. All right. Th thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we'll move on to the next presenter. Thank you. Okay. So if I can welcome Shana Yi, um, uh, who's a research associate uh, with the Vancouver Infectious Diseases Centre, who's going to talk to us about community pop-up clinics. Over to you, Shana. Thank you. Hello, today I'll be talking about the Community Pop-Up Clinic, a unique strategy to engage the inner city in HCV elimination. So on a weekly basis, a team including healthcare providers and support staff, including myself, conducts a CPC event at a single room occupancy dwelling in the inner city to provide point of care testing for HCV and HIV testing, or to ascertain previously identified HCV infection status. Um, for viremic individuals, treatment for HCV infection is offered in a context of a low barrier program with medications delivered daily or weekly at the place of residence if need be. Strategies are in place to limit loss to follow up and maximize retention and care throughout the treatment and beyond. This analysis was undertaken to evaluate the productivity of the CPC program for the provision of HCV therapy to vulnerable inner city residents and to determine the success rate of antiviral therapy utilizing this model. And finally, to evaluate additional benefits of this intervention on preserved engagement in care, such as reduced reinfection and mortality rates. Our results were collected from January 2021 to December 2022. 80 CPC uh, events were conducted. Typically, 20 to 30 people were screened at a three to four hour our event once a week. Uh, 1,440 patients were screened, 33% um, being antibody positive, and out of those, 69% were viremic, and 87% are currently engaged in care. Demographic information was collected from 75% of the individuals who voluntarily collect, uh, completed our questionnaire. The median age of being 46 years old, 35% female, 34% indigenous, which is a key target population for our intervention, and, and almost two thirds experiencing housing insecurity, while the vast majority use opiates and fentanyl, um, and with half having experienced a medically significant overdose. Engagement in care has been secured in 289 cases, 257 in individuals have started treatment, 95% of whom who have completed treatment, 228 are confirmed as cure, achieving SVR 12, with two documented cases of a virologic relapse, one being cirrhotic, and one documented case of reinfection. By MITT analysis, the SVR rate is 99%, and overall in this vulnerable population of six to seven opioid deaths a day, we only documented two overdose deaths with over 326 prison years of overall follow-up. Our strategy for engagement in care um, after demonstration of viruma is highly successful, having a high cure rate, low short-term reinfection rate, and few opioid overdose-related deaths. Programs such as ours will play an important role in HCV elimination in the inner city and may also be an important part of our societal response to the opioid crisis. I would like to acknowledge the VIDC research team along with our partners and funders. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Shana. We've got time maybe for one or two questions, maybe I could ask. You, you find a, a relatively low antibody prevalence, if I'm correct, was that yeah. to be expected? And, but it, you know, although you had a very high RNA prevalence mm. amongst the population that you did test, suggesting not a lot of kind of treatment going on, is that reflective of the, of the wider community? Um, I believe so. Uh, 
we were also quite surprised that the antibody uh, percentage was quite low as well. But um, given the fact that the RNA uh, percentage was quite high, it shows that our community needs to work better in terms of treatment. Indeed, reached a really key population. Well, if we could just thank Ashana and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so next I would like to welcome Eric Opheim um, from the Agency for Social and Welfare Services from the city of Oslo in Norway. Thank you. Uh, I want to present to you some um, unpublished results from uh, three different point prevalence studies conducted in Oslo, uh, Norway. Here are my disclosures. In the pre-DAA era, the prevalence of uh, chronic HIV among people who inject drugs in Oslo was stable between 40 and 50%. In 2013, a low threshold nurse-led HCV clinic for people who inject drugs was uh, established. And since 2018, DAA treatment has been offered without restrictions to anyone with an HCV uh, infection. Norway has set an ambitious target of eliminating HCV by the end of 2023. So the aim of this study was to assess changes in chronic hepatitis C virus prevalence among people who inject drugs in Oslo. Point prevalence studies were conducted in 2018, 2021 and 22 among people who inject drugs attending low threshold services in downtown Oslo. Assessments included blood sampling by venipuncture and a self-reported uh, questionnaire. A total of 281, 261 and 247 participants were included in 2018, 21 and 22. All of the participants had a history of injecting drug use and 75, 79 and 84% reported injecting drug use within the past four weeks prior to inclusion. So HCV RNA prevalence decreased from 26.3% in 2018 to 14.2% in 2021 and to 8.9% in 2022. There was also a significant reduction in prevalence among those 40 years or older. Among men, those who reported more than 20 years of injecting drug use, those with recent injecting drug use, and both those who reported sharing and those who did not report sharing of injecting equipment the past four weeks. Uh, in the adjusted analysis, undetectable HCV RNA was associated with year of participation. Participants in 2021 had a 54% reduced odds of testing RNA positive compared to 2018 participants. And 2022 participants had 73% reduced odds compared to 2018 participants. Being HCV RNA positive was also associated with recent injecting drug use. In the 2021 and 22 population, women were less likely to have received HCV treatment with 43% reduced odds of previous treatment compared to men. To conclude, there has been a substantial decrease in prevalence of chronic HCV in Oslo among people who inject drugs since 2018. To reach and to maintain elimination, future strategies should be adaptive and reflexive to drug trends. Um, strategies to enhance treatment uptake among women should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, we're running just a few minutes behind, so no time for questions just now, but feel free to seek out Eric and ask him any questions you might have. So our final speaker, I believe, is joining us online. Uh, if I can introduce um, Merdad Kersey. Um, 
hopefully will appear. Okay, no problem. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for uh, uh, waiting to watch my presentation. I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about uh, a national study looking at factors associated with engagement in uh, Hep C virus cascade of care among people who inject drugs in Iran. <clears throat> And I would like to begin by acknowledging all people who inject drugs uh, participated in our study. So, as you know, globally, the highest prevalence of HCV is reported in the MENA region, account, uh, accounting for about 20% uh, of all people living with chronic HCV. And uh, PVD are the most affected population, but uh, by HCV in the region and the pooled HCV anti -pre antibody prevalence among people who inject drugs was estimated at uh, 49%. And uh, it is estimated about uh, 2,000 uh, and uh, uh, 221,000 PV were estimated to living with chronic HCV in the MENA, with uh, the largest number estimated in Iran. Uh, however, the continuum of HCV care among people who inject drugs in Iran and the MENA region are quite under study, and understanding the HCV cascade of care and factors associated with the engagement is crucial for designing intervention for elimination program. So the objectives were to examine engagement in the HCV cascade of care and uh, to assess factor associated with HCV testing among people who inject drugs in Iran. So using uh, respondent driving sampling, we recruited about 2,684 PVD from 11 major cities in Iran in 2020, and we conducted face-to-face -face interview measures on sociodemographic and uh, behaviors, and. HCV cascade of care. Uh, we examined the number and proportion of individuals who self-reported ever tested for HCV, tested positive for HCV antibody, diagnosis with HCV, initiated HCV treatment, and achieved uh, SVR. And we applied the logistic regression model to evaluate factors associated with HCV testing. So among the total sample, only 12% uh, percent ever tested for HCV uh, four, and 4% 4 uh, tested positive for HCV antibody and 3.7% diagnosed with HCV. And of diagnosed cases, 44% uh, linked to treatment, 15% initiated treatment, and 6% tested to check SVR and only 3% uh, achieve SVR. So, uh, HCV antibody testing was significantly higher among people who inject drugs who reported uh, more than high school education than less than high school education, and uh, people who injected in private places had 42% uh, higher odds of HCV antibody testing compared to those who injected in public places. Also, PV uh, with lower frequency of injection had 90% higher odds of HCV antibody testing compared to those who injected daily. And uh, PV who never experienced stigma within healthcare settings had 75% higher odds of HCV antibody testing. Finally, uh, PV who tested positive for HIV had over seven times odds of HCV antibody testing. And in conclusion, we found a substantially low engagement in HCV cascade of care among uh, people who inject drugs in, in Iran. And as the first point of entry into HCV cascade of care, testing programs uh, need to reach uh, PV not engage in services, particularly those involved in high-risk injection practices and those who experience stigma in healthcare settings. And 
HCV prevention and treatment programs uh, tailored for people who inject drugs are needed to enhance har both har harm reduction efforts and access to HCV care in Iran. Thank you for your listening. Th